You may have heard many news stories about all the thousands of exoplanets that have been discovered using the Kepler telescope. As of the 1st of July 2018, Kepler has confirmed the existence of 3,797 planets in 2,841 star systems, with 632 systems having more than one planet. But are any of these planets habitable? What are the chances of life being found outside of Earth? Are we alone in this universe, or can life be more prevalent than we think? And if there is life, where can it be found? I'm Alex McColgan, and you're watching Astrum, and together we will explore known exoplanets in the Milky Way galaxy to see if any of them have the potential to harbor life. Now we've not been able to actually image exoplanets in any kind of detail. In fact, this is the clearest real image we have of an exoplanet, taken by ESO's very large telescope, which may make you question if this is the best image of an exoplanet we have, how can we discover exoplanets and how do we know life could be on one? To answer the first question, we have to look at how Kepler worked. Kepler is a space probe which constantly monitored about 150,000 stars in a fixed field of view using its camera. The field of view focuses on a patch of sky near the constellation Cygnus. This is what Kepler can see. The data it collects is sent to Earth and analyzed to see if any stars dim periodically. You see, the concept is, if a star's planet passes in front of Kepler's view, the star will dim. If it dims, for instance once every 100 days, we can confirm that it is a planet and it takes 100 days to orbit. Kepler is really good at finding exoplanets. Before Kepler came into operation, these were the exoplanets we knew about. As you can see, most of them are many times the size of Jupiter. Since Kepler came into operation, we have discovered and confirmed the existence of thousands of exoplanets, with thousands more still unconfirmed. Remember, these are planets which have been discovered in only this patch of sky. There is still a lot more out there. Kepler unfortunately is no longer functioning how it used to, as some of the reaction wheels inside it are broken. However, the good news is that there is a new exoplanet finding spacecraft called TESS, which just came into operation a couple of weeks ago, which will cover an area in the sky 400 times larger than the Kepler mission. It is expected that during its mission it will be able to find more than 20,000 exoplanets. In order to determine details about an exoplanet, the distance from us to its star needs to be worked out using complicated maths. For stars within 400 light years away from us, we can use trigonometry and the orbit of the Earth to create a difference in angles. Beyond that, there is no direct measurement, so the best current method is by comparing a star's color spectrum to its brightness. The color spectrum of a star corresponds to what type of star it is. Once the color spectrum is known, scientists then know how bright the star should be. Comparing the apparent brightness, or the apparent magnitude, to the actual brightness, the absolute magnitude of the star, reveals how far away it is. This method is proven, as scientists have done this test on stars that are within 400 light years and the results produce similar distances in both tests. Once the distance to the star has been determined, the amount the star dims can be used to see how big the planet is, its distance from the star, and the exoplanet's mass based on the orbit of the exoplanet. Using other telescopes like Hubble, ESO, and eventually the James Webb and the W First telescopes, these exoplanets can be studied to find out their composition particularly of the atmospheres. The way this is done is again from the spectra of the exoplanet's light. To give you an example of how this is done, imagine white light shooting through a prism, producing what is actually a blend of colors spanning from violet to red. Light from a star shooting through an atmosphere produces a similar effect, except certain bands of light are not present. This indicates there is a certain gas in the atmosphere that is absorbing the light in that wavelength. 
not allowing it to pass through. The dips in this image shows what Earth's spectrum looks like as sunlight passes through the atmosphere. The dips show that oxygen is present, as well as water vapour, carbon dioxide and methane. These gases all absorb the sun's light at these wavelengths. Looking at the section of wavelengths and comparing them with other planets in the solar system, sulphur compounds can clearly be seen on Venus, and methane on Neptune is apparent. This means that as we study exoplanets in detail and determine their spectra, we can search for atmospheres that resemble our own. If it does, then the chances are that it could be a habitable world, and also that it may already harbour life. Inhabited planets could have telltale signs of life, like smog and pollution, which would be seen in the planet's spectrum. So, have any exoplanets like these been found? Well, out of the thousands of exoplanets that have been discovered, 16 of them are thought to be rocky planets and sit in the Goldilocks zone, or the habitable zone of their respective stars. Let's just remind ourselves of the ingredients needed for life as we know it. We believe that liquid water needs to be present. Liquid water is essential because biochemical reactions can take place in water. Water is also an excellent solvent that easily dissolves and carries nutrients and other compounds in and out of cells. Life forms on Earth are made primarily of water. In fact, our human bodies are more than 60% water. Life also needs sufficient protection from cosmic and solar radiation, which can break down and damage cells. On Earth, this protection comes from our magnetic field. There also needs to be essential chemicals found in the ground on Earth, and an energy source, which for us is the Sun. So the Goldilocks zone is where, assuming other conditions are right, liquid water could theoretically pool on the surface. This zone is always different depending on the parent star and how big and hot it is. Looking at our own solar system, Venus might just be in the Goldilocks zone as well as Earth and Mars. We already know that only one in three planets in our own solar system's Goldilocks zone can have liquid water so just being in the right place is not always enough. The type of star is also important. Our star, although seemingly active on the surface, is actually quite stable compared to a lot of other types of stars. The Sun will likely be 10 billion years old before it burns out. On the other hand, the hottest types of stars will only last for millions of years in comparison. It is thought that this is not enough time for life to form around it, certainly not animal life that can communicate as we understand it. So we have a lot of filters we can now use to narrow down our search for habitable worlds. Out of the original 3,797 confirmed planets, 16 are terrestrial planets that orbit within the Goldilocks zone of their stars. However, the habitable zone of some stars means the planets are close enough to be tidally locked, meaning only one face of the planet sees its star. This proximity to the star also means the planet is exposed to a lot of solar radiation, sometimes thousands of times more than we are exposed to on Earth. In other words, out of those 16, only four are likely candidates to be Earth-like, although it is worth mentioning that exoplanets in systems like the TRAPPIST-1 system could still be habitable or have life even if all the planets are tightly locked. But the Trappist system is worthy of its own video, so I won't expand on it here. These four exoplanets are Lighten B, Kepler 62f, Kepler 186f, and Kepler 442b. Realistically speaking, though, we don't know much about them other than their size and mass. Our current technology isn't accurate enough to determine the composition of their atmospheres. One of the James Webb Space Telescope's missions is to study known exoplanets in greater detail, which is exciting as, in combination with the finding power of the TESS telescope I mentioned earlier, this next decade could be full of discoveries. But by using the Kepler data as a fairly decent sample size, can we estimate how many habitable worlds there could be in our galaxy alone? 
Ethan Siegel did a very interesting article, which I will link to in the description, where out of those 150,000 stars, the chances of seeing anything at all using the transit method is very small, less than 1% for a planet orbiting the distance of Mercury, let alone Neptune, which has a 0.001% chance of detection. This is due to the way planets tend to all orbit along a plane, and if it's not lined up, we won't see anything. Also, smaller planets are much harder to detect. Look how hard it is to see an Earth-sized planet compared to a Jupiter-sized planet. Taking all these things into account, Ethan Siegel placed a low estimate of 6.4 billion planets in their star's habitable zone in our galaxy, the Milky Way. This means at least one of them has to have life too, surely. Well, we really don't know how prevalent life is at all. And until we do some serious research and improve our technology, we have no way of knowing yet. Some people claim that all factors considered, the chances of humans being able to develop and live on Earth was 10 to the power of 10,123 to 1. In other words, extremely unlikely. How many factors actually are needed to be right for life to exist? Is it all over the place or purely a freak coincidence here? Building on what we know already means the future is going to be very exciting. We've talked a lot today about how Kepler discovered exoplanets via transits in front of their host stars. As I mentioned, these transits are quite rare as the orbital alignment of the star's planets has to be just right for us to detect them. But did you know that this is not the only way to discover exoplanets? Brilliant.org has a course specifically about worlds beyond our own, including a section on the radial velocity method, or gravitational wobble, the first known method for detecting exoplanets. Their course explains in detail how this is possible and teaches you how scientists have been doing it for decades. The great thing about Brilliant is that it can take you through the mechanics of astronomy at your own pace so you can truly understand what it is I'm talking about. That's why it's a perfect match for my channel. Did you want to know more about the topics I've talked about today? Then give Brilliant a go. If you go to brilliant.org forward slash astrum, you can sign up for free to have a sample of their courses. And by using that link, the first 200 people will get 20% off the annual Brilliant premium subscription. If you want to support my channel and also expand on your own knowledge, I highly recommend this website. So what do you guys think about life in the universe? I'd be very interested to hear your theories and concepts in the comments. Just remember to keep it civil. If you like the video, don't forget to share it and subscribe. That helps me most of all to grow my channel and to make more videos in the future. So, all the best and I'll see you next time.